Welcome to the Kanoi Church Podcast. We're glad that you're interested in connecting through this teaching time. If you'd like to connect further, feel free to reach out to us through our website, kanoichurch.org. For now, enjoy this teaching from Kanoi Church, where our mission is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Good morning. It's, uh, it's good to be with you guys this way. We're getting closer and closer to reopening the church, which reminds me to remind you that we have worked on developing a plan to reopen the church starting with Easter. And the next thing that is on the horizon that needs to be accomplished when we reopen the church is reopening children's ministry. And we've been talking to some other churches, figuring out how are they reopening, what sort of precautions are they taking. We're developing a plan to do that. But here's what we need. We need volunteers in order to do it. And we need enough volunteers that this doesn't fall on a singular person because it's important to us that we don't burn our volunteers out. We want to take exceptional care of our volunteers. And so we need a sustainable way to move forward with children's ministry. And that's going to come from all of us working together to share the load. So I want to just remind you that we're going to keep asking, we're going to keep letting you guys know that we need volunteers to help do children's ministry on a regular basis. So if you're willing to try, if you're willing to give it a shot, then give me, contact me. Send me a message on Facebook. Send me an email. My email is nick at kanoi.org. Super easy to remember. Um, the other thing I wanted to remind you too, we get this question a lot. I, I couldn't tell you how many messages that I get on a regular basis. When we reopen the church officially, are we gonna continue streaming our services? And we wanna let you know that we are definitely doing that. There's a number of folks out there that access us online and it's the only way, the only avenue they have to access this is their church. And we recognize that, we understand that, and so that's not something we're gonna stop. So even when we reopen, we're gonna continue broadcasting online, so you can catch us online if you need to. All right, all that being said, I wanna jump into our, our series. We are doing a series called Uncommon God, Uncommon Us, and this is the series that's going to lead us into Easter, into a time of communion, and, and, and here's what we believe. It's really simple. We believe that if we're serious about following God, then our understanding of who God is and who God wants us to be as individuals and who God wants our community to be should actually affect our lives. We really believe it should. You, you can't be a, a spectator when it comes to your relationship with God. So we want to remind us on a regular basis there's a cause and effect relationship that we have with this, this spirituality, which is why we're doing experiments every week when we start the service. And so our experiment this morning, our cause and effect, wow, that's so weird because the speaker is right behind me. Man, okay, our cause and effect, I have an egg. It was uh, loaned to me by Scott Boyer. Scott Boyer would like his egg back. Um, but our experiment is, is simply that I'm going to drop it into this, um, this glass container, all right? I hey guys, I hope I hit it. Okay, I don't know if you can see it, from where you're at with the camera, but the egg broke. So we have a cause and effect relationship, right? If we were looking at the broken egg and we asked ourselves a question, what caused the egg to break? What caused it? Well, the fall did. Gravity did. Gravity acting on the egg or the pastor that climbed to the top of the ladder and dropped it caused the egg to break. Gravity forces the egg to fall and break. The egg doesn't have a choice. That's how a cause and effect relationship works which is why in Luke 6, 46, Jesus asked the question, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I say? Why bother calling Jesus Lord if you don't act like Jesus calls us to act? Don't disguise yourself as one under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Actually be someone who is under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Mike, there's a slide, a cause and effect slide. Can you put that up for me? I just want to start the sermon out today by showing you the cause and effect that we're trying to talk about. This, I mean, this is the, the crux of the sermon. Our picture of God affects how we live for God. Our picture of God affects how we live for God. Researchers have done an experiment where they put a mother and a one-year-old in a room together, and they observe the way the child and the mother act and interact together. At some point during the experiment, they'll have a stranger enter into the room, and they'll see how the child reacts to the stranger. Is the child afraid? Is the child 
doesn't really care there's a stranger there. Or is the child drawn to the stranger? How does the child interact with its mother when the stranger enters the room? A little later in the experiment, the mother is instructed to place her purse on the chair in the room and leave. And the, the purse on the chair is sort of a, a subtle uh, explanation to the child that the mother's going to return, right? It's a subtle, nuanced understanding that the mother's coming back. But they, they observe the one-year-old. What happens when the mother leaves the room? Does the one-year-old become really anxious? Are they really upset? Are they afraid? Are they nonchalant? Like they don't care that the mother's left the room. Then the mother returns to the room. And the researchers are looking to see what the presence of the mother does for the child. If the child is full of anxiety, does the presence of the mother put the child in a place of ease? Does it soothe the anxiety? Then researchers instruct the mother to leave again, and they measure the reaction when the mother returns and, and leaves. What they're looking to see is the attachment of the child to the mother. If the upset child runs to the mother or crawls, whatever the, the process is, the child is working off the belief and the understanding that if they go to the mother, they will be comforted. Their anxiety, their needs will be taken care of. That is a positive attachment. If the upset child doesn't care that the mother has returned, then the child has somehow already learned in its life that the mother is not the source to take care of its anxiety and its needs. What it does is it shows a lack of attachment. Now, you may not be surprised to know that your relational understandings when you're a child affect your relational understandings when you're an adult. There are a lot of adults who have a high attachment security, all right? About 60% of all people have a high attachment security which means that they were the child that would have run to their mother. And, and adults who have a high attachment security tend to be more satisfied in marriage. They experience less conflict in their relationships, and they're more resistant to divorce. But just like there's 60% of adults who have a high attachment security, there's 40% who do not, who learned at an early age that those relationships, that's not where they were going to be cared for and soothed. There's a couple of... Uh, factors that might mark a person who deals with a lack of attachment. I'm going to share a couple with you. Just because you might go, oh, that's me, doesn't mean that you have an attachment disorder, but it might mean, huh, maybe I should think about that. Why do I feel that way? Why is that something I experience? So here's a couple of things. Um, if you're a person who has conflicting feelings about relationships and intimacy, I want it, but I don't want it. I want it, but I don't trust it. If you're a person who lives in that sort of tension, Maybe in your past, there's been some relationships that were marked with low connection. Um, if you're a person who desires to develop romantic relationships, but you're constantly worrying that the person you're in a relationship with is going to hurt you or leave you or both. Somewhere along the line, you learned that that person that you want to care for wants to leave you or wants to hurt you. Okay? Um, if you push aside your feelings and emotions and you try to avoid experiencing them. I don't know about you guys, I've been there. I've been, you know, come out of certain situations where I've been hurting so bad that all I want to do is feel numb. I don't want to feel the things that I am feeling inside and so I do my best to just push those things down. I've been there, I don't know if you have. Or there's the last one. Um, you fear that you aren't good enough for the kind of relationship that you want to have. And so much of the time, if you fall into that category, often we end up self-sabotaging ourselves. We self-sabotage our relationship because deep down we just don't believe we're good enough to have a, a good marriage or a strong, healthy bond with our significant other. Why do I tell you all this? <laughs> because last week we talked about how Jesus sums up all the law and all the prophets by telling us to love God and love others. Loving God and loving others, that's relationship. Jesus sums up the entire Old Testament, essentially, in relationship. And if we're honest, when we think about loving God and loving others, our relationships can get a bit twisted. Now, according to attachment theory, um, our previous relationships form the, the default settings for our current ones. It's just kind of like the manual. Our previous relationships are the manual for our future relationships. And of course, some of our most formative years are when we're children, adolescents, teenagers. 
those relationships and what we learn from the people that were in relationships when we're that age, they stick with us. The hurt and the pain that we feel as children sticks with us. So those relationships when we're kids, they're essentially, they're incredibly important. It would be true to say that your relationships here and now today also continue to inform your future relationships. So, if you have only ever experienced people as uncaring or uninvolved or unable to provide you with comfort or unable to lessen your anxiety, then you're going to have trouble trusting people. You're gonna have trouble feeling loved by them. You're gonna have trouble relating to them and you're gonna find it difficult to grow close to them. We all have these little things that kind of take us back to a, maybe a not nice moment. You know, if you, you walk in somewhere and you smell like chocolate chip cookies baking, maybe the smell takes you back to grandma's kitchen and you just, oh man, I remember as a kid in grandma's kitchen and the whole world was so right and simple because it was just chocolate chip, you know, the smell takes you back in that moment, right? But we all have these moments in relationships where something is said or something that is, it happens we're treated in a certain way, we're made to feel a certain way, and it can all of a sudden take us right back to somewhere we don't wanna be. One of those things for me is when people hide their true intentions. That drives me nuts. I, and I, it takes me back to some places that I, I don't really wanna be, but I'll give you an example. Um, I've never apologized for my lack of political fanaticism, and I don't apologize that my biggest Political concern is not who to vote for, but how much it divides us as a community. I think by now you probably know that about me. Uh, so when somebody that I respect and value and I care about and I know cares about me asked if they could meet with me during the pandemic to pray, I thought, yes, I would love to do that. Especially because in the middle of the pandemic, all those things that I care about, like how much politics are dividing us, was at this crazy height. And it actually was gonna get higher yet. I didn't even know that. And so I said, yeah, I'd love to meet with you and pray. And we prayed for about five minutes, but that was only after I had been a captive audience for over an hour hearing about political viewpoints and passions and opinions about what I should be doing, all kind of bunched up in spiritual rhetoric. It felt more than a little disingenuine. And if I'm honest, although I didn't want it to affect me, although I don't feel like I'm a person that harbors like negative feelings, the next time somebody said, hey, do you wanna to get together and pray? You better believe that ran through my mind first. Oh, does this person really wanna to get together and pray? Does that person really have a genuine desire to pray with me or do they just wanna you know, talk my ear off for an hour about their feelings and opinions? It, the whole experience made me a little gun shy for the next time that somebody wanted to get together. So what I'm trying to admit to you is that even my current relationships affect my future relationships. We all, if we're, if we're honest, I think we all can probably admit that. And here's the thing, it's not just our people relationships, not just our horizontal relationships. Our previous experiences affect our vertical relationship. It affects our relationship with God. If you have only ever experienced a God who is distant and provides you no comfort, if you've experienced those foxhole prayers that you send up in the moments that like, life feels like it's just falling apart and you, all you've ever experienced is they go unanswered. If um, you've always been told that God is angry and he's vengeful and he wants to, he's bent on your punishment, then it doesn't surprise me and it shouldn't surprise you that you have trouble feeling loved by God, that you have trouble trusting God and you have trouble growing close to God. What we know about the divine, what we know about God, affects us, okay? Let me put it into a, a different, uh, let's take Yahweh, our God, out of it. Let's talk about Greek mythology for just a second. I like mythology. I know I've talked about Greek mythology a couple of times during this series. I really like Greek and Norse mythology. Um, but sometimes it's easier for us to take ourselves out of Christianity for a moment, look at a different religion, and observe some truths that we can then take back with us. Um, in the Greek pantheon of gods, Zeus is the most powerful god. He's the highest god. He's the big dog. And um, the stories that are handed down about Zeus 
There's a lot of them. So I want you to think of yourself as a first century, in the time of Jesus or the time of the Apostle Paul. You're a Greek person, and you've grown up on the stories of Zeus. The stories that you're handed down about Zeus are full of Zeus sexualizing human women. And in in fact, he would take on the form of their husband. He would take on the form of other gods or strangers, solely bent on sleeping with them. Sometimes these stories include rape. Um, Zeus would often fall in love with his daughters, and he would pursue his daughters. Even to the ends of the earth, his daughters would take on different forms to try and avoid Zeus, but Zeus was notoriously relentless, and he would seek them out until he could have his way with them. Now, I want you to tell me, If you are a first century Greek person, you've grown up with these stories, all you've ever known is worshiping the Greek gods, then tell me how in the world you feel about a god. What does it tell you about yourself if the big boss god, he steals people's identities, he uses deception and rape to satisfy his needs, that all he does is sexualize human women and his, his daughters, that even when his daughters run away, he tracks them down. Tell me how that doesn't affect your impression of how to treat women. Tell me how it doesn't affect your impression of what it means to be a man. Tell me how it doesn't affect your impression of what's acceptable to the gods and what's not. If you're a woman, tell me what could your relationship possibly be with this male god this big dog. How much do you think as a woman you're worth in the eyes of Zeus? What are you really good for? See, what we know about God, our picture of God, it impacts the way that we work on behalf of God. Remember the term we used at the beginning was high attachment security. Could you ever possibly feel secure, even attached to a God like Zeus who does all these really terrible things and seems to be okay with them? Could you ever feel secure with a spouse who worships that sort of God, that that puts that sort of God up on a pedestal and says, well, that God did this. this, this seems to be okay. Could you ever feel secure there? See, this is where I think that Yahweh is different. See, it's true, if all you will know is a bad picture of God, then all you're going to believe is bad things about God. But Yahweh presents himself differently. Although Zeus changes his identity and uses deception and steals other people's identity to do all of this stuff, Yahweh has always been who Yahweh is. Yahweh wants you to be secure in your relationship with him. He's not honored by your constant fear or even the repetitive saying of the sinner's prayer. I don't know how many of you, like me as a teenager, said the sinner's prayer dozens of times, hoping and praying that one of those times took and I wouldn't end up in hell, right? Or or somewhere along the line you learned, oh man, if you didn't ask for forgiveness for that one sin you did, that one sin's gonna come back and get you, so you better, we start praying, at the end of the night I'm like, okay, I said a bad word and I treated my dad this way and I gotta make sure I ask for forgiveness for these things and oh, maybe I'll say a blanket prayer in case there's any sins I forgot. God, anything I forgot, please forgive me for those things. That's not the sort of relationship that God wants us to have with him. That's a relationship that's totally bound up in fear, right? I'm so insecure in my faith that I just, I'm constantly worried about whether or not I actually have salvation. God doesn't want me to be terrified that I've somehow accidentally pushed him away or transgressed in a way that he doesn't forgive. God wants me to be secure. Think about the Old Testament. Think about how how God identifies himself, okay? When we're the sheep, God identifies himself as the shepherd. Not the butcher, okay? He's the shepherd. He's the shepherd and we're the sheep. When we're the clay, he's the potter. When we're the created, he's the creator. When we are in slavery, he is the liberator. God's relationship with us, the way that God identifies himself to us in all of the stories throughout the entire Bible is not as the butcher, is not as angry, is not as hoping that I'm terrified of him every step of the way. These are all Old Testament motifs. Sometimes we get it in our head that Jesus came and somehow made God a bit more loving. That Old Testament God, oh, he is a scary guy, but luckily Jesus came and and Jesus is, well, the son gets in the way of the father and makes it all good for us. That's kind of what we end up believing. In the reality, 
from the beginning, we learn that God is the same throughout history. Last week, we did an overview of the Ten Commandments. Just after God gives Moses the Ten Commandments, where are God's people? They're, Moses is on the top of the mountain with God. His people are at the bottom of the mountain, and they have made themselves a false idol of gold, and they're worshiping it. While Moses is at the top getting the commandments for the covenant between Israelites and God, the Israelites are down below breaking the covenant already. And God's mad. And Moses says, remember, God, remember, we're your people. And so what, is, what does God say? This is Exodus chapter 34. Then the Lord came down in a cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. As he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to the thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. You know, in the very beginning of this covenant with God, of God saying, you're my people and here are the commands I want you to live by, God tells us who he is. Compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to the thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellions, and sin. And you're gonna say, Nick, there's more to that verse, right? You're right, there is. That's the part where it says that God gets the last word, that there is punishment for some people, right? And here's the problem. The church has done a terrible job at representing who God is. What we've ended up doing over the history of time is that we have focused on a singular facet of God and we have told our children and our children's children that God is angry. He is so angry he's coming after you. We haven't focused on all the facets of God. We focused on the one. And so when we read this passage, we don't see compassionate and gracious and slow to anger. No, no, no. We see he punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents of the third and fourth generation. That's what we read. That's what we capitalize on. And that's what the church is focused on for decades. That's what I grew up with. And that's what we need to stop. I want you to think about, like, I, I, well, maybe not for you. I, I, don't, I don't know what your relationship is to your father. I have a good relationship with my, my, uh, my earthly father, okay? My, <laughs> my earthly father is amazing, but I also had a good, healthy fear of my earthly father, too, because if I stepped out of line or I did something wrong, he was going to let me know there was going to be some punishment, now, if the only thing that I knew, the only thing I paid attention to was that one thing about my father, that he was gonna punish me if I stepped out of line, then my relationship with my father would be incredibly flat, incredibly narrow, and it would not be a good one. All I would do is be scared of him. But I want you to think about your relationship with your father or your relationship with your heavenly father as a diamond. And as you take that diamond and hold it up and you spin it around, there's all these little facets that catch the light and shine in different ways. Why would we ignore all the different facets of who God is for one? For one. Why would we ignore that he's compassionate and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness, that he, he, uh, he maintains his love to thousands, he forgives wickedness, rebellion, and sin? Why would we ignore all those shining facets so we could focus on the one that says God is going to punish those who need punished? That's silly. My relationship with my father is so much more than that. With my earthly father, I knew that he loved me. I knew that he cared for me. I knew that if I needed him, he was gonna be there. And I knew if I stepped out of line, he was gonna smack me, all right? That's the whole picture. We need to pay attention to the whole picture and stop paying attention to the singular facet because look at our cause and effect slide again. What does it say? Our picture of God affects how we live for God. If my picture of my earthly father was only that he was gonna get me if I stepped out of line, it'd be hard for me to stand up here and tell you guys that I have a good relationship with him. What's your picture of God? Just somebody that's gonna get you if you step out of line? Is that why you're constantly saying the sinner's prayer, hoping you've covered your bases? Can't answer it for you.
My favorite poet is an Austrian guy named Rilke. And Rilke said, a person isn't who they are during the last conversation you've had with them. They're who they are through the whole relationship. They're who they are through the whole relationship. Everybody has a bad day, right? So let's do an exercise this morning. Let's just take, let's just not take God at his word. In Exodus 34, God says he's compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to the thousands, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And yes, he punishes those who need punished. What if we say, all right, God, prove it. Prove you're all those things. Okay, let's look at the beginning. The creation of the world and the creation of mankind. Was the world created out of violence and bloodshed? Did he create mankind in an attempt to be able to sit back on his cloudy couch and kick his feet up and make us slaves? No. He created the heavens and the earth out of love and creativity. He created mankind in his own image and he called us his children. Mankind eats the forbidden fruit from the tree. God kicks him out of the garden. That doesn't sound too forgiving, Nick, until we understand that, that in eating the tree, they sinned. And when they sinned, they created a separation between mankind and God. And by staying in the garden, they'd have access to the tree of life, eating fruit, staying alive forever, and allowing the chasm to separate them from God forever. By closing the garden, mankind is now having their, na- their days numbered. Mankind's no longer eternal. Mankind will at some point die and the separation ends. In fact, God cares so much about that separation that he's going to do something even more incredible down the road. He's gonna send his son, but we'll talk about that later. It's not about being an angry God that kicks people out of the garden. It's a God that loves us so much he doesn't wanna be separated from us for, for eternity. That sounds like compassion, slow to anger, graciousness, and love. Well, Cain kills Abel. Yeah, does God kill Cain? no. He marks Cain and sends him out into the world. If God's so angry, why didn't he dust him? You think God can't make man dust? He created him out of dust. <laughs> Done. Nope, that doesn't sound like angry God. It sounds like a compassionate God that spares Cain, even though Cain just killed his brother. What about Abraham? Doesn't uh, God tell Abraham that he has to go sacrifice his son? He does, you're right. But good, doesn't God also provide a ram? so that he doesn't actually have to sacrifice his son. And in doing so, doesn't God declare to the whole world that he is God, that Yahweh does not want, he doesn't desire, he doesn't approve of human sacrifice. In a a world where all religions sacrificed other people and their children, suddenly there's a religion on the face of the planet that has a story that's a part of its history that declares love and faithfulness rather than child sacrifice. Well, God's people became slaves for 400 years, Nick. That's generational slavery. You're right. God's people were in Egypt as slaves for 400 years. But what does Exodus record? That God heard their cries. God raised up Moses. He put Moses in Pharaoh's household where Pharaoh could learn and study and build relationships. And then God uses all of those things to free his people. See, God is faithful and maintains his love to thousands. And all of that happens before Moses goes to a mountain, gets the Ten Commandments. God's people are breaking the commandments already. All of that is before God says, I'm compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to the thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. In fact, after God says that, it gets that much easier to prove that God is all these things. Just flip through your Bible. The walls of Jericho. Was there a a great battle? Or did God's people get to walk around it playing their trumpets when the walls fell down? About the day the sun stands still so that the Lord's army can continue to fight while the sun is high in the sky. How about all the prophets that he sends, the messages that he sends to his people trying to draw them back to him over and over and over? How about the time that a child named David battles a giant who should have just killed David, but somehow a child beats a giant? How about the Psalm of Korah? That's an interesting one because Korah was a person who led a rebellion against Moses. 
And then God uses Korah's descendants to write some of the Psalms in our Bible. Talk about redemption. About the building of a temple a place where the Holy Spirit could come and reside, a place where you could come and worship God, a place where you can connect with God, a a whole system set up to make you good with God. Elijah, Elisha, any of the stories about them. About the time that three men are thrown into a furnace and they don't burn up. Or the time that Daniel's thrown into the lion's den and the lions leave him alone. How about when the exiles return from Babylon or when Nehemiah rebuilds the walls? I mean, God is faithful and loving, compassionate and forgiving, and it's written all over the entire Old Testament. And the cool thing is that the story doesn't end with the Old Testament. It goes into the New Testament. In John 14, 9, Jesus says to Philip, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus says that. It's as though um, God in heaven desired mankind and his chosen people to be his image bearers on earth. And when we did it so imperfectly, we set the stage for a Messiah to come and do it perfectly. We set the stage for a Messiah who would be a, a perfect image bearer of God in heaven. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. God would send his one and only son into the world. Not to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That whoever believes in him would not perish like mankind began to do when they left the garden, but would have eternal life. God takes the chasm that was begun in the garden and he closes it when he sends his son to earth to die on a cross for us, to die on a cross for our transgression, to close the chasm, to restore peace, to bring us back into the fold of eternal life. Colossians 1.15 says, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over creation. This is how God brings us back into the fold. This is how he upholds his promise to us. How God shows us, indeed, he's compassionate and he's gracious. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in love and faithfulness. He maintains his love and he forgives wickedness, rebellion, and sin. This is how he proves it. He sends his Son And he sends his son to die on a cross. He sends his son to be led by humans, by beings that are far less powerful than he is. He shows us how compassionate and gracious and loving he is when he gives up his power and he gives up his life to remind us that he has never not been compassionate and gracious slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Folks, we broke the marriage covenant with God. And by the laws that we agreed to as God's people, we should be stoned. And none of us get what we deserve. We're the ones that were unfaithful and the one who was faithful the one who was innocent, takes the punishment on himself rather than us. If your picture of God is that he's angry at you, if your picture of God is that he hates you, that he's hoping to punish you, that he can't wait to send you to hell, And thank goodness that Jesus stepped in the way. Your picture of God is twisted. If your picture of God is of an angry God like that, how does that impact the way that you represent that God to the people around you? How can you possibly say that God is love knowing that God is so angry and vengeful and hateful? What if God is love? Not just when Jesus was here, but always. What if God has always been who he said he was? What if everything that we know about God was just an imperfect representation? The day was a bit cloudy. We tried to see the sun. We tried to describe the sun. We know it's warm. We know it's bright, but we haven't seen it because the clouds got in the way. And when Jesus comes, he is the image of the invisible. 
Suddenly the clouds are gone. For the first time, we can see the sun in all of its glory and all of its brightness, and we realize that who Jesus is is who God has always been. If your picture of God is one that loves you so much that he would give his own life for you, if your picture of God is one where even when you're breaking the covenant at the bottom of the mountain, he is still loving you and choosing to love you. If your picture of God is one where he has been faithful for the entire arc of history for his people, then you can feel secure. You can attach to that God. That's the sort of God that you run to when he comes back in the room. We can trust that God to be exactly who he says he is. He hasn't hidden his identity. He's not lying to us about who he is and what he wants for us. That's the same God that sends his son into this world to save it. The same one that says, if you believe in my son, you can spend eternity with me. It wasn't just a new idea when Jesus came. That's what God's goal has been the entire time. If that can be your picture of God, then (laughs) what you represent to the world is vastly different than if your picture is angry. I want to show you a video today to kind of wrap up our sermon here. It's It's a video about a school teacher. And in the best of ways, I mean this in the best of ways, she is a very normal person doing an incredibly hard but very normal job. And her faith has completely shaped the way that she interacts with her children. It's completely shaped what she hopes for her children. So I want to show this video to you and, and let you see. Here's a concrete way that we can live this thing out. When I first moved to New York City, I thought I knew why I was coming here. It was going to be an adventure. I had my own agenda. I had no idea how much I would fall in love with the kids of the city and how much they would teach me about myself and change my life. I treasure my morning commutes on the subway. It's my time. Sometimes it's my only time with God. In those moments, I know his love for me, and I know that that's gonna carry on throughout my day, and I know it's gonna help me to do my job well. The Bronx is one of the toughest neighborhoods in the country. 75% of the people live below the poverty line, and where there's poverty, of course, there's gonna be violence, and sadness, and strife, ugliness. Right in the middle of the Bronx is Middle School 223, where I'm a reading and writing teacher to sixth graders. It's where I spend my days every day. A lot of our kids at our school go home to shelters. They go home to homes where they are in charge. They see people get shot in front of their apartment door. Life has not been easy for them or kind to them. Morning. Good morning. Hey guys. Thanks for coming in quietly. Many of my students haven't been loved well. They've been abandoned. They've been promised things that have never come. They've been promised relationships with their fathers or mothers that have never happened. And so they're just worn. They're weathered and they don't trust love. On the first day of school, the first thing that I tell them is, I've been thinking about you all summer. Like, I love you already. You may not believe this, but you can't earn my love. You could make straight A's all year and 
have perfect behavior all year, or you can get detention three times a week and I'm gonna love you the same. And then I spend all year trying to prove it. So I want you to think back to Monday. We chose that one personal narrative that we're gonna publish and celebrate and put out there to the world. Who am I as a person? What do I really want people to know about who I am? Well, it wasn't until recently that I realized that God had been preparing me for this job, for these kids at the school right now. I grew up in Georgia, mostly at my grandmother's house because my mom and dad were divorced. And then when my dad got married, I felt like I wasn't good enough. He, he wanted me to be perfect. I just wasn't good enough anymore. But I know I don't need other people to say I'm okay anymore. I did that my whole life. And I think I'm finally done. So maybe now I can just be Lindsay. And if I make mistakes, then oh well. I'm not only as good as what I do. Growing up, and especially now, even as an adult, I still long for that love and acceptance. And God has shown that to me and given that to me so that I can go and give these kids the same love and acceptance that they have always wanted too. Over time, I really do believe this classroom becomes a safe haven for them, a place where they feel accepted and they know they're going to be safe and it's comfortable. I think God loves these kids so much, more than I could ever hope to love them. But I think He wants them to rest and to be happy. I think He wants to heal their hearts. Every day they walk out of my classroom, and at the end of the year, they walk out of my classroom forever. It's so hard. It's hard not knowing what lies ahead for them or what type of choices they'll make, and I just have to rest. I've done everything I could do. I've loved them the best that I can. And my hope is that they'll figure out that God loves them so much more than I ever could. Do you think that Lindsay is the kind of person that those kids run to? Do you think that Lindsay's the kind of person that when she comes back in the room, the kids don't even care that she's there? I don't. I think those kids run to her. Did you catch that? Lindsay realizes that she has a school year with those kids, and then they're gone, probably forever. She knows how long she has with those kids to make a difference, to try and love them, to love them as much as she can with the realization that God loves them even more than she does. You and I have no idea how long we have, period. We have no idea how long we have with our family, with our friends, with our coworkers, with the people that we sit next to on a Sunday morning. We just don't know. What we do know is you have this moment right now, right here. To love one another. And this is not some sort of soft version of the gospel, my friends. This is as true a gospel as I could possibly ever tell you. All the law and all the prophets are summed up with love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And when we love our neighbor as ourself, it changes their understanding of what love is. We become the new reset all of the manual and all the things they ever knew about everything before. All those kids that don't have a father who've been promised things and it was never delivered to them, when they interact with Lindsay, they know she's someone they can trust. They know that she's someone that they can interact with and that when she says she's gonna do something, she does it. It begins to reset all of the bad and the nasty that they've had to deal with. Even if just for a moment, and just for a moment, there's a window of opportunity where the love of God has a perfect moment to plant its seed because Lindsay loves them so well in a way that changes everything for them, and yet God loves them more. (laughs) 
Following Jesus is, is, is hard on, in so many ways, but it's not as hard as we make it. What is the greatest commandment, teacher? Love the Lord your God. And the second's like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's not as hard as we make it. So what are you going to do this week? Are you going to hold on to that old picture of who God is? Angry? Vengeful? Bent on destruction? Or maybe your picture of God was that he just doesn't care. He's uninvolved. When you ring him up, he doesn't answer. He goes right to voicemail. Are you going to hold on to that old picture? Or can you join me and believe that God is exactly who he's always been? And that Jesus finally gave us the clearest picture we'll ever have of him by being the perfect impression of who God is, by being the image of the invisible. And that when we love people around us, God loves them so much more. And we love people around us, it opens a door. You have right now. Choose now. If there is somebody that you need to tell that you love them, tell them. Don't wait. If there is somebody that you feel like the Holy Spirit has been prompting you to forgive, to call, to touch base with, to let them know how much you love Jesus, don't wait. Tell them. You plant the seed. Let God water it. You don't have to have all the answers. Our Father in heaven does. You have to be obedient. Our success is measured by our response. Do you remember that from week one? Hanging in our volunteer firefighters' firehouse. Our success is measured by our response. All you need to do is be obedient. Our God is uncommon. In his name, may we also be uncommon. Let's pray. Hi, this is Pastor Nick. Thanks for listening. I hope something that you heard today was very helpful. If you want to connect with us further, feel free to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, or our website, kanoichurch.org. Sure, I'm glad we're in this together.